my sense of time is just completely flew it all together. Like, there's just no rhyme or reason to it. Flew it all <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Hi there, I'm Ken from Brighton. I'm from HAD, ADHD Island. We're the national representative body for people with ADHD. While supports are being put in place for children, it certainly comes under the headline of a lot done, more to do. While there is stuff there for children, there's virtually nothing out there for adults. And to help to redress that balance, what we want to do is develop a series of videos. And in that we're going to talk to people about their real experience of living with ADHD in Ireland in the 21st century. So for the first in this series, we're delighted to welcome John Doyle. John is a native of Tralee and he's an accomplished theatre director. So thank you very much, John, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to schedule come and talk to us today. We really appreciate it. So just going back to the very start, so what's your earliest memory of thinking that there was something different or something about you that was... Uh, Which is a step from the rest of us. I'd say all from when I was in my mother's womb. Um, hmm. I, I, I suppose I was always one of those kids that didn't fit into things. Um, I always felt that I didn't um, fit into things. I, I, I suppose I always kind of felt that... Um, I don't know, it's just when you're a kid growing up and you feel that you're not, you're not part of things, it's almost like you're from the outside looking in, I think. Um, and I suppose it's funny in finding out about the ADHD because, um, because I'm gay as well. Hmm. And I was, I was always aware of that. I always knew that like, from from as far back as I can remember. But um, I thought that was the big differentiating thing about me. Uh, yeah. So I grew up hearing the um, the negative connotations and the remarks and stuff, and I knew that I was what these comments were. Where? So like th that up until so probably the age of eight, twenty-five or something that I kind of struggled with and that mm -hmm. I thought was a uh, differentiating thing and then you find out about the ADHD 38 years later yeah. and of course which is equally as differentiating but probably even more so yeah. um, and also some of the things I might have done in my kind of wilder years like so I took an overdose when I was 19 or 20 uh, when I came out because of course ADHD people can have extreme yeah, emotional yeah, yeah, reactions yeah. things yeah. I was only thinking about yeah. this lately that could have played a part yeah, in that. Yeah. Um, so to have found out that you have this other thing yeah. that is even more differentiating about you is um, it's very surreal. And that could have actually played a part in the way I coped with the, the other side of things mm. as well. I think just when we were talking about just before that, just talking about that period in your life in 1890, <clears throat> you're describing yourself as an angry young man. Oh yeah, complete. Oh yeah, yeah. I was unbelievable, unbelievable. Well, tell us about it. <laughs> uh, I was. Um, it wasn't like I was going over, oh, I was too cute to go breaking the law. Because um, mm -hmm. if I did, I'd get caught and they know me. Um, it was just, I was incredibly angry. I mean, I think it was from 15 to when I left school. Um, I was getting incredibly frustrated. Well, I was angry, but I, and I didn't know what I was angry about. Yeah, sure. um, and I would be, I always felt that um, a lot of the time I had so much energy in me that, that a room couldn't carry the energy that I was feeling. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what that was, but it, it, that that would cause me then, I think, to probably go towards the more, we'll say, whatever you want to say, antisocial behaviours yes. or whatever. Yeah. I got into the drugs when I was about, I'd say about 23, 24, and out of curiosity, mm -hmm. um, because I love extremes mm -hmm. um, and I love risk. Yeah. I still do, but it's, it's just more, it's kind of it's less self destructive now. So, I, yeah, I was doing that for about a year, a year and a half. And um, yeah, every every night I was out. Um, I think what happened then was I I stopped. No, I didn't have a big. Oh, I'm going to stop giving up drugs. I just stopped, and no. that was it. It, was, it got boring for me yeah. because like okay. the thread was over. Yeah. I was like, yeah, I need to do something else now. And um, the theatre thing. I was in counselling at the time, and um, it was around the same time I was doing an acting course, and I had never done anything even remotely like that before. Three years ago, yeah, I was 24. And when we were wrapping up the sessions, the, um, the counsellor had said to me that, he's, I think he said something like he found it fascinating how um, when I'm describing something, because I, I gesticulate, because often when I'm thinking, when I'm talking, it's like I'm all, I get all handsy. It's almost like I'm trying to build, physically build thoughts that are in my head. And I, I, I'm aware of it now, but I wouldn't have been back then. And he said that he told me that um, he could see me writing a book and, you know, and things like that. He said I was very articulate. Stuff that I never even Now I wrote when I was a child, was, mm -hmm. when I was a kid. Um, I was doing the acting class at the time, and I remember the um, sessions had stopped. Um, I had written a script just as an exercise. Um, and I thought, right, chance, chance, man, I don't know. 
and seeing if I can get this done. So what I did really was, um, I had written the script. Um, I cast myself in the role. Yeah, and th that was the start. I, I did the uh, short films done for me. One of them got into the Cary Film Festival years and years ago. I can't remember what year it was. Um, um, then I started doing more and more acting, and then people were like complimenting me on the acting. And um, people were like, oh, you're going to be the next. Yeah, be, yeah, I was yeah, going to be the yeah, next Colin Farrell of all time. Yeah, yeah. Um, so about get your heart out. Yeah, so. Um, I, that was great. I did that for years. Actually, I, I moved up to Cork to study acting formally. Mm -hmm. um, but what I realised was I, I never enjoyed acting. I, acting was my recovery from, um, in many ways, the way I was oh, in terms of the self destructive stuff and the, the, not just self destructive but destructive in mm -hmm. other areas. Um, but I never enjoyed it. Yeah. But because people tell me that I was good at it and I grew up because I'm obsessed with them. I mean, I am mm -hmm. like a walking IMDb. I mean, I'm like. <laughs> There are very practical things in life that I would be absolutely disastrous, I remember, but like, you could ask me anything regarding film and chances are I'll have it in my head. Mm -hmm. um, I did that for years anyway, and um, on a break from college in Cork when I moved up, I decided that I wanted to direct a play. Mm -hmm. So I chose a Clockwork Orange, which is probably one of the trickiest plays you could. to cast 43 characters and it's musical numbers and stuff like that. And now people tell me that I'm absolutely insane yes. to take on that from my first But I was going in blind, I was naive to it basically. What I realised from that was the directing was my thing because I think, um, again I've only realised this consciously since the diagnosis, I think rhythmically and, and visually. Mm -hmm. So I never thought before my diagnosis in terms of what way or what, what way I thought or anybody else thought, in terms, you know, in terms of categories or whatever. Um, and the show went really well. And I had a great experience on it, and there were 23 in the cast, so we had doubled up with some of the roles. It went, I mean, I think to this day it's probably still the most commercially successful thing I've directed, and that was about eight years ago. Um, that's when I realised, yeah, this is my thing now. Um, because it's, it's expansive, you see. So when I'm thinking, because I think like that, if that, if that, if that makes sense. Yeah. So when you're, when you're directing a play or a film or whatever, you, 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 you can do that. So I found out that I, that I could do this, uh, then I kept on directing, um, yeah, I just kept on directing for the next few years, um, one act plays, uh, full three act plays and stuff like that, and I just kept on, kept on doing that for the next, I think it was, five, six years, and that's until No Borders came along, mm -hmm. uh, but it's the first show, for me, it's the first show that I've worked on since the diagnosis, so I think... Uh, I was doing it with the mindfulness of that, but I could put the hyper focus on it. But I found that when the show was finished, I kind of went into free fall a bit after that because I had no hyper focus. So yeah. I was like, uh, mundanity, do you know what I mean? Then yeah. I, know, I know that, and I got very agitated. I got, I got significantly more impulsive. I got less, I, I felt less grounded because I had nothing to focus on. So if you take that away from me, I think, I, I know I'm always, I think part of my story that pe people have grasped on because I'm saying that ADHD is a blessing, not a curse. And I do say yeah. it as that. But I'm very mindful of the fact that I found something, I found something to, whereby um, I could consider it a blessing. If I didn't have, the cre if I didn't, if I'd never found out about the creative stuff, I'd say I could be drug addict, mm -hmm. I could be in prison, I could be in psychiatric ward, I could, it does, because I wouldn't have had anything to focus on. So, because I get those little whiffs of the, when, when, the, when the focus kind of goes away from me, when the theatre stuff is taken away from me. Um, so I'm very mindful that I was lucky, uh, that I was lucky to, to find that. But if I didn't find that, because the way I was going before that, yeah. I'd say it could be any, any one of those things. Um, so I'm lucky, but I'm, it, it does obviously, of course, pose its challenges as well. Yeah, and that, I suppose what I would say to any parent, I'm no professional, I, the, any parent who has a kid that they think has, has it or does have it, find what they're good at, mm -hmm. find what they're passionate about. Yeah, I was reading somewhere you said that a friend of yours got a diagnosis for ADHD in his 50s, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. a few yeah. years back. So, how did you feel when you get your diagnosis? Do you um, feel that people treat you differently than they know? Do you feel that you treat people differently now that you have the diagnosis? No, I've made a point. I don't want to become one of these people that says, so your man, they don't know, it's your man is ADHD. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to become one of these people. No, a couple of people have said it to me since I was diagnosed that they themselves through no, speaking to me, it, reckon so. they yeah. have it. But I don't want to be, yeah, I'd say you have ADHD. Yeah, I don't true. want to be that person, mm -hmm. no, like, you know. But um, when my friend was diagnosed in his 50s, um, 
his, his son, I was going to say his kid, but his, his kid is in his 30s, you know, uh, his son was diagnosed when he was like seven. Mm -hmm. uh, and th this guy then, his father was diagnosed when he was in his 50s. Mm -hmm. And he had this big emotional reaction to it, as, as, yeah. as it generally happens. Yeah. But at the time I couldn't understand, because I didn't understand the I didn't understand the nature of ADHD. I didn't understand why he was um, coping or reacting this way yeah. um, until I was until I got the diagnosis myself. What like 15 years later, I think it was, and um, I saw them on the phone just before Christmas. And I said, "Joy, you know, I, I said I owe you an apology." I said because when you reacted, when you reacted to your diagnosis, I said um, I said I judged you. Yeah. And I said, but I've gone through a similar thing. Do I think people see me differently? Um, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I don't think they do. Mm -hmm. um, I I think people are very busy. Like I don't mean in a bad way. I think people who've known me for a long time know me for a long time. They know. Yeah. And I said people with ADHD AD, AD, or head cases. When I say head case, I mean that in a good way. Like, mm -hmm. People have always known I've had a bit of a wide streak, mm -hmm. and that I'm very animated, and that I never shut up, basically, and things like that. So I don't think to a lot of people, I don't think me. Saying I did is any surprise to people, you know. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot, and so I don't think it affects them, but it also doesn't affect them because they don't understand how deeply it affects the person as well. Yeah. Yeah. Because what I, that's what I've learned. At, like I mean, I've had to recontextualize thirty eight years of my life. Mm -hmm. Well, that's um, you know. So well, I was just in recontextualize. That was going to be the next question. In terms of looking at your personality and yourself, what do you see as John? What do you see as ADHD, John? Um, I, I think, I don't know, I, I think I'm still trying to figure that out, because I'm, I'm only diagnosed for uh, seven months. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so I think, I'm, I think that's what I'm trying to figure out myself. I think I've always been very um, wary of saying, I think we're all very wary of saying that any one thing defines us. Yes, yeah. um, <laughs> because we're, we're, like, we're multifaceted. But when it comes to your brain, mm -hmm. It's uh, the way I kind of see it at the moment is that kind of that does define who we are because that, that like I mean that dictates everything that you do. Um, so I think um, there, yeah, there's been an awful lot of um, taking stock of things and and realizing things anew, but also things that I wouldn't have been so honest with myself about for a long time. Mm -hmm. It's forced me to be honest about those uh, things like. Um, the judgment side of things, for instance, yes. in terms of how people perceive you if you're doing something that, like, for instance, me on social media, years ago I used to be a demon for throwing stuff. No filter. No filter no, at all. Yeah. Um, everything went up. Yeah, everything. And I'm, I'm not too, no, I post a lot now, but I'm not too bad. But I still... Shall um, I your page? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I still get... Um, you, still, you, you do still get that feeling of judgment. Yeah. Like, the thing is, I, I suppose what I can't quite understand is why people judge somebody based on their actions when they're not actually doing something that hurts another person. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, that's one of the... Th what I realised, one of the things I realised was that um, I've always been um, the badass. The, 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 excuse the language, the bollocks, the, the mess up. Um, and I think I got used to being that because, well, for a number of things, I like people, I think some people find it refreshing because I'm very, I'm very blunt, I'm very direct. Um, I do have a wide streak, I've done a lot of things and I don't regret any of those things and I never apologise for any of those things. Um, and I love the fact that I've lived the full life, the good things and the bad things. So, I th the, the judgement thing, I mean, I always felt, I think I, what I realised after the diagnosis was because I was always the troubled one the troublesome one, uh, you know, all of that. I don't think I was, like, I was, I was looked on at that, but I don't think I fully absorbed it until um, what I realised after the diagnosis was that the way I was seen, I felt that I was that person. Yes. Um, which I don't think I'd really given any thought to before that. A lot of the time I played up to how I was seen, so I played up to being the yeah. messer. But it's got, it went to such an extent now that I just became that person anyway. So I, I do have that streak in me. One of the, um, w w one of the most challenging aspects of it is the, the misunderstanding yeah, from sure. the outside. Because y your brain is wired a certain way. And you do things a certain way. And you express yourself a certain way. Say, for instance, the way I express myself on social media. Yeah. Uh, or, 
or even in, in another situation where a person may not know me very well. That annoys some people. Um, there was that feeling as well of being too much mm -hmm. or too full on or, or too or, or annoying or whatever. Like I'm aware of all these things. I might say I might not say it, but I am aware of it because mm -hmm. I pick up on everything. So I'm very um, like that counselor who, who I mentioned earlier. He told me before uh, that time that he had, he's never seen instincts like yeah, yes, he has, like those seconds. Mm -hmm. So I'm very in with that. So I pick up on all these things. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's very frustrating when you're not doing anything out of the way to anybody and it's simply by the way that you, that you express yourself, mm -hmm. that you find that, and that people don't often say it, but you know when you're being judged. Mm -hmm. um, there's also the outsider element, um, because I suspect, I know for me personally, um, there is that outsider element with, with me and the ADHD because I don't fit into any one bracket and I always feel like... Um, I would be the person outside the building looking in at the other people inside the building. Mm -hmm. I don't mean that in a self pitying way, I mean I've learned to embrace all of that, but um, uh, it, there are the challenges, so there's that sense of, um, it can be quite isolating sometimes, mm -hmm. and, and I've always felt isolated, but I never knew why, I suppose, until mm -hmm. that diagnosis, you know? Yeah, but that's a, if you can just go back to the diagnosis, just mm -hmm. talking about that, and this is purely a hypothetical question, mm -hmm. I mean you're 38 and you're looking good on it, um, but you know, you, you describe, you know, things in your 20s, 30s, and you know, following your way and coming out where you are now. Do you think it would have changed your life or made life better or different if you were diagnosed as a child? I'm glad I wasn't because I wouldn't have gotten the chance to do what I have done. And I'm not, like, again, I'm not saying to anybody go out and do what I've done, but for me personally, I'm glad I've lived a full life. And my life would not have been the way it was, and one thing I can always say is that I have always lived my life on my own terms, whether people liked it or not, do you know what I mean? Because I couldn't do it any other way. Okay. And I like the fact that I have a wine streak and that yeah. I've done all these these, uh, these, these, different things, you know? Yeah, but I mean, the talk about wine streak, there still is the, the boring, mundane parts of life that we all have. Oh, yeah, that's the challenge, you know, maybe, yeah, I hate that. You know, how do you cope with, you know, the... Yeah, yeah. I despise it. Tax returns or whatever. I'm a disaster. Say, you know? I'm a dis I hate it. I hate it. That's that to me. That's that's what I was saying. like boredom is the enemy. Like mm -hmm. the mundane stuff, I despise. Mm -hmm. That's my challenge, and I think that's what people from the outside don't see. Then, um, like, like you know, I always have money to pay the bills, and I always pay the bills. Do you yeah. know what I mean? But I hate doing it. Mm -hmm. Tidying my room, stuff like that. Just mundane stuff. I absolutely despise because I want to be. I want to be excited yes. all the time. I want to be gratified all the time. So I want to feel, because I feel everything to the nth degree. So if it's a positive emotion, I'm going to feel that to the nth degree. And if it's a negative one, I'm going to feel that to the nth degree. But I want to be feeling something to the nth degree the whole time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, or that's when I guess, that's, that's yeah, I hate that. I hate that. But obviously just in terms of, you know, there is the daily stuff. And you're, I mean, I know you talked about time management. Things. You were <laughs> saying, yeah, time management ADHD can be a challenge. A very good describe is like that you're waiting through three foot of water. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, saying, yeah. You know, if you yeah. got the diagnosis, you thought time was different, or the same for everyone else. Um, like we're yeah. all living on John time until... I thought everybody thought the same. I thought, I thought everybody's sense of time was the same, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I realised then that... Um, I was only a few weeks ago, I was reading some article or something. Uh, my, I now know my sense of time is completely fluid, and that's something yeah. that I would not have been honest about yeah. to anybody before yeah. the diagnosis. But what I've actually realised is that the people with ADHD, their sense of time is completely different to the sense of time of, let's say, a non-ADHD yes. person. So I don't know what, um, just like a non-ADHD person doesn't know what it is, our sense of time is like. Um, I, I don't know what their sense, I'd love to know what their sense of time is, to be quite honest, you know what I mean? Because I live in this kind of, a, like this bubble that's ever-changing and ever-moving, but it's all... But nothing is kind of solid. Yes, That's my yes. sense of time, literally. Yes. I mean, I know I have to get to a place, but I mean, I could be legging it down the road yes. to get to that place, even if it's up three or four hours in advance. But yeah, my, my sense of time is just completely fluid altogether. Like, yes. There's just no rhyme or reason to it. So, John, I mean, I was going to chat about your life there. You know, you've talked about, you know, where you were at 18, where you were at 25, 35. And you know, mm -hmm. you've got to a place now where you're out there directing players on a regular basis. But just in terms, you know, for people looking and listening, what would be a couple of things you would say, a couple of strategies, hints and tips that you would give to people with ADHD? I'd say, look, I mean, it's planning anyway. I mean, you have to have an idea, even though you might struggle to get to the place, you, you like, you mean, it's structural, structural. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, as, as tricky as that is with the flow of time and stuff like that, you have to have structure. So if you have, if you have no structure, that's when you, I think, that's when I find when I go into free fall. 
So that's why I'm lucky with the theatre. And when I meet up to the theatre, I have interviews and I have this and this and that, and I have rehearsals and things like that. But I have to think about when I'm not doing theatre, what am I going to do? I'm back in the gym, at the gym now and I can feel myself getting slowly more obsessive about it as I go on. So I'm not saying that people won't be upset by it if they want to go and be obsessed with something, yeah. well, but yeah. just um, structure is key. I mean, if like, if I didn't have structure, I'd be shagged. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I mean, I think anybody, they need structure. Um, I'd say as well, getting up early. It's very easy to, you know, it's, it's, for, in the, it's very easy to find a thing and get me late. I'd say just don't do it, get up early. Um, try and, I would say try not to put the thing you, you could be obsessing or hyper-focusing on, try not to devote the entire day to it. Mm -hmm. Try and balance it out, that's something I'm still learning to do. But I think it has to be a lot more than just the, the, the other, the, the, just that thing as well, because when it goes, you're going to have to find something that you can apply that structure mm -hmm. to, you know? So one thing that I was reading about you is that, you know, you sleep three to four hours a night. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like fucking... But we yeah. all need to rest. I mean, what do you do to find that peace and quiet? Uh, yeah, very little. I, like I said, I love film. When I can get myself to sit down and watch a film, mm -hmm. um, I will be very um, focused on it. Um, the tattooing again, it's one thing that I've realised, and it was again, again since the diagnosis, is that... Um, I, when I'm getting tattoos done, to me it's a little, it's always been like, even though I have some manky looking tattoos, not <laughs> quite honestly, going back years and years ago, um, most of the new ones are grand, um, but all the new ones are grand. Um, it's, I, to me, it's a ritualistic thing, um, and I do go, I do feel probably the most grounded that I am. Ironically as well, um, when I'm in a relationship, usually is when I'm at my most grounded. Yeah. Because, um, because I think because of my because I generally attract white guys. I don't know why that is. But surely, me. Opposite is trap. But yeah, but it, it never works like. Yeah. So, so, I'd be bouncing off the walls, and then you're talking to a really quiet person. Then so just yeah. you know what I mean. Nobody feels like. Do you know yeah. what I mean? But like, when I am in a relationship. Um, I tend to be more grounded because I think the um, the attention and the thing because I'm a very kind of empathetic person, I'm a very kind of a caring, kind of a warm person. So uh, that um, I think it kind of disperses more evenly. Yeah. So then I have my work, I have the relationship settings, and I have the things. So I think things ge generally yes, become yeah. a bit more grounded. So more structure, more staff. I think the there is, yeah. yeah. I think there is. Um, so yeah. Um, I think that's probably, um, in terms of, let's say, more everyday life, it's when I am seeing somebody, yeah. which is rare. <laughs> but when I am. That's a new man with yourself. I'm like, to not, not beating down a past my door. Oh. Like but um, yeah, I think that's, um, I have found that because the, the attention disperses. Wow. Um, so I, because, because basically, my, my life feels fuller than you see. Yes. And that's, yes. if you're really hasty, you want. The fullness of life. That's what I want. I want the fullness of life in everything. So if I have my, my work on one side and I have relationship and other things, and that's usually yeah. and the tattooing then on a kind of a different kind of level because it's kind of a ritualistic thing. And I do quite. I get quite. It's the closest thing to Zen that I would ever get. I will never be Zen, but it's the closest thing to it, you know. And um, because it's just it's just kind of a ritualistic thing that I, and I find it fascinating. And um, it just does something to me. I think. It's great. You know? I appreciate that. And um, big thanks, of course, to John for you know talking to us today. And if you'd like to tell us all about your ADHD story, drop us an email at info at ad.ie, and um, or give us a call at zero one eight seven four eight three four nine. That's zero one eight seven four eight three nine. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much for watching. <laughs>